We would like to have a discussion with our speakers, a uh, discussion with the participants in the room as well as online. Let me take the first round here in the room, and then I will come in the next round to online participants. They have invited comments from you, questions from you, and they want to learn. This is midway through the project, as I understand Will mentioned. This is a good time. Please raise your hand, give us an indication, and as the mics will come to you, give us your name and institution. Um, and uh, Corinne, there are hands right up in the front uh, with the gentleman there. And then um, I'll come back and I'll take Jessica next. Tell us your name and institution. Hi, thank you everyone for wonderful presentations. My name is Ty uh, Beal from GAIN. I just had a question about um, how to go from the purchase of foods, which contain many um, inedible parts, and then are prepared often in ways that produce yields, um, to matching that with the um, nutrient requirement data. So how, I didn't hear any addressing of this, but these can have big implications. So accounting for refuse in the purchase data and uh, cooking yield. Thank you very much. Let's be efficient and take the lady right next to you, and then we'll come to the side of the room. Thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for these Tell great us your presentations. Name and yes, my name is Gina Kennedy, and I work for Bioversity International, which is one of the CGIR centers. And um, I'm actually part of the Agriculture for um, Nutrition and Health Research Program of the CG centers. So. Um, I was really happy working for um, on on the topic I work on, which is biodiversity of you know the world's um, food, to see a lot of people mentioning seasonality. So um, my question is, if you could explain more about how you calculated the price of fruits and vegetables across the year and how you considered seasonality in your current um, indices, and then a follow-on question and probably Anna's thought a lot about this, would be um, if we took those fruits and vegetables, for example, that are in season, and then calculated the price of those. So I realize that there's a limited range of, of things that we can collect, but I would be very interested to know how the price would decrease if you actually look at what is seasonally available for that time period throughout the year. Um, and also then just to make a comment that I really liked Derek's last slide about um, actions for Candessa and others. We're working on combining the one and the three. So Derek talked about food-based dietary guidelines in many countries and also um, about looking at more diverse foods. So I thought it would be nice for our colleague in Ethiopia to know that we're working together with the Ethiopian Committee for Food-Based Dietary Guidelines and we've just done a review paper of the fruits and vegetables um, known in Ethiopia. It was a literature review. We found 40-some papers and over 100 species of fruits and vegetables. So when we're only collecting price information on five or six of those, we're missing out information on about 95 species. So we're trying to get those incorporated now into your food-based dietary guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. Let me come to this side of the room. We have Jessica. And uh, then I'll take Will next, uh, Corinne for Will Martin. Jessica. Hi, my name is Jessica Heckert, and I'm with the International Food Policy Research Institute. And I think that my question is best directed to either Kalyani or Derek, but certainly um, is open to, to whomever is interested in responding to it. So in terms of a, a low-cost diet, we're thinking of what the, the price that's paid by the consumer. But there's also a cost within the household in terms of the labor of intensity of, of preparing that food. Um, and that cost is most heavily borne by, by women in, in the household. So I've, I'm wondering if you have already or intend to take, to con take into consideration the, the labor costs of food preparation within the household in terms of calculating the lowest cost diet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Let me go to Will Martin next. Will Martin from, from IFPRI. Thanks very much. Great presentations. Beautifully organized. Um, the, my impression was always that that initial Stigler work back in the 1940s <laughs> led to the perception that the least cost diet, and it was done in the United States, uh, bore no relationship to what people actually consumed. And the more recent work seems to say, well, for poorer people, it does. So 
where is the borderline? Where does the least cost diet matter and where does it, where does it cease to matter um, in terms of what people actually consumed? Thank you. Let me take one more question and I'll come to the next round. And it is the lady in the striped shirt, um, Corrine, right here in the front. Oh, Mary's getting you the mic. And then uh, panelists, I'll come to you for a rapid response. Thank you, Chesa Lauder, RTI um, International. So um, my comments are really reflect 20 years I spent with WHO in the regional office for the Americas, where you know, everything's switching from you know, what's a he healthy foods, by and large, to unhealthy foods. So getting right at the first picture, Anna, um, showed and kind of what I'd been writing until Derek put it on his fourth point, so that <laughs> clearly you're thinking about it, which is kind of why I wanted to bring it up. Because um, food policy has to be driven by both, absolutely has to be driven by both, because the transition is happening so quickly. Um, and so, you know, my question is really kind of what specific plans do you have for working on this? Because I think to sort of start engaging countries you know, clearly healthy diets may be your first, um, but to engage countries that are absolutely experiencing this, where there's n often no policy around ultra-processed food products, um, et cetera, I think is, you know, gonna bite them really quickly. India has huge rates of diabetes, for example. Um, so th my question is specifically, what exactly are you planning um, along these lines? Um, and also, you know, to also, as you mentioned, the substitution, because how are these, you know, healthy foods, you know, the substitution effect to these unhealthy foods, getting a choice, what people actually are eating and kind of what they want to be eating. Um, and I guess my last question is, you mentioned, again, Derek, in your last um, slide about all the different agencies you can co coordinate with to sort of start to share data, et cetera. I mean, how are you engaging FAO? Because, it, you know, ultimately, you know, kind of really, FAO could drive this a lot quicker because, you know, they're kind of setting these UN global standards, so to speak, for the, the type of price data um, that's being collected. Thank you. Super. We have a set of five questions. I know that there are more hands, and I'll take them in the next round. Why don't I ask you to begin and then work with here or our colleagues? Yes. Uh, so I suggest we go in, in perhaps in reverse sequence of the questions uh, so Anna can take Jess's questions first. Uh, sure, yeah, thanks for highlighting that issue because it's so important in the ways that we see diets shifting. Um, so we still have yet to develop exactly how we're going to account for the unhealthy food prices as well. Um, we're exploring a nutritious food price index that would be kind of a companion to the food CPI, where the food CPI weights by uh, expenditure share and if people are spending more on Coca-Cola, it gets a larger and larger weight in the food CPI. And we want to reweight the items by nutritional value so that you would see the index change. For, so when more nutritious foods get more expensive, the price index would go up and have some accounting within that for price changes of unhealthy foods. So that is yet to be explored. Um, also, we have been having conversations with FAO and also with the World Bank and are thinking about that very strongly in the future in terms of how to uh, scale up across countries. I totally agree with you that they could have a very strong role uh, as a normative agency. And Ghana is really kind of going to be the initial sort of test case and model country for how to work with governments and then be, learn from those lessons in order to work with the more international agencies. Um, I, could also take a couple of the first points Georgia. if you like. So very quickly on Ty's question about the uh, edible portion, we do account for the, uh, the edible portion of foods when we create these indexes. And in Gina's points about seasonality, we also, the, the question was how do we account for the price decrease if we looked at the lowest cost item in each season, and we do that. So these indexes, these metrics are constructed so that at any given time point, the lowest cost items are selected. So it's not the same items selected over time. It's uh, dynamic with what's lowest cost at any given point. And your, your point about the huge diversity of fruits and vegetables also um, could be an important point in terms of intervention because if the finding is that nutritious diets are unaffordable, and fruits and vegetables are 
a big piece of that on affordability. One of the possible implications might be for certain areas that home production or wild collection becomes more important in accessing a nutritious diet. So it's important to have that information that you suggested about um, this huge diversity of foods available. I'll speak briefly to Will Martin's question about realism uh, and then turn it over to Kalyani for uh, the labor time question um, and also um, maybe also seasonality if you want to. Um, then there's a bit more to say about edible portions, which Jan will share, very interesting. Um, so on, re on uh, the realistic nature of these diets, um, it really comes down to Derek's point about how big the food group is. So when these were originally done to demonstrate uh, both pioneering actual methods um, for mathematical programming, which is what we're doing here, um, it was a very short food list. And so the diets were unrealistic because you had huge amounts of uh, peanuts or uh, soybeans or something. And what we found is as you add more different foods, and you especially capture these elements of uh, seasonality. So people are eating mangoes in mango season, and they're eating uh, orange slash sweet potato in non-mango season. That sort of substitution is what we're capturing here. And that's what that granularity is what gives us the, the realism. But there is an element of unrealism, which gets to um, Jessica Heckert's question about labor time, which Kalyani will, I think, talk a little bit about in the, if you want to in the India context. You could if, if you want to. Uh, I don't really have an okay. answer, it's just an, uh, an acknowledgement that that's a really important point. And I think especially in the Indian context, it's almost exclusively women who will be preparing the meals. Um, also in the Indian context, there's a real dearth of data. If we had information on time use, that would be ideal, but unfortunately we don't. So basically just to say that your point is really well taken, but there is really only so much that we can do with the information we have. Um, also, just quickly to answer the question from here on how we're estimating seasonality, in the Indian data set, it's just a regression of the food prices for each food group on dummies for the months. So what I depicted there was the coefficients on those month dummies. That's it. Excellent. Yeah, do you want to say anything about the edible portions yeah. and the foods that are here? And thank you for uh, bringing um, the edible portion question, actually. So actually, there is another whole area that we should take more investigation is about the food data. So uh, how transparent the food composition data are and how transparent also including the edible portions data are. So for example, you can say that uh, for kind of fish, fish like white fish, it can be consumed about like 90% here uh, in the US because you know uh, in the market, the fish is more like readily to serve. What in Africa probably is, can be as low as like 50% or 60%, which we don't know. So most uh, in our projects, we use the multiple, uh, you know, uh, the food composition data sets. Some are from the U.S. and some are from the local context. And we are also uh, actually examining or investing uh, some like new methodology to compare how to better use a local knowledge, you know, a local data set, and how to also compromise some data with uh, using uh, the U.S. data or more international uh, you know, uh, um, data set. So that's uh, part of the question. And also for the seasonality, this is also a very good question. And how you capture the seasonality using the price data or basically using any kind of different data. And there are multiple ways to do that and different models are developed, have been developed and used in different disciplines, in uh, environmental studies, in uh, mathematical studies, in economic studies. And if you wanna, you know, each of them has some you know, pros and cons. Some models have a better, you know, projection, or, uh, yeah, but uh, they need like longer term for like data. But some, uh, data, uh, some models um, can use like a shorter period and have like a rough, more rough, and a quick estimate. And we are also uh, trying some like new methodologies or borrow some new methodologies to be applied in this uh, seasonality, price seasonality analysis and hopefully to be published uh, very soon. Thank you. And I think Derek had a few more points and then another round. Yeah, I just wanted to respond a little bit to a couple of um, Chess's points. Um, closer. Um, so, yeah, one issue, so Anna talked about, you know, the fact that at least the agricultural marketing surveys are not including many nutritious foods. The same problem actually for unhealthy foods, because for many developing countries, these unhealthy foods are relatively new products. I think the statistical agencies are a little bit slow to update and include some more of the pro processed foods. Same thing for household surveys, um, you know, it might say aerated beverages, you don't know whether it's sugar sweetened or just, you know, uh, 
uh, aerated water or, or, or whatever. So that's an issue that, uh, that also needs to be handled in terms of improving the quality of um, food price measurement. And you mentioned the FAO, yeah, who's historically focused on measuring producer prices, because they probably perceive that as more of their mandate. But yes, they, they, they could play a role in um, tracking consumer prices. The other two international agencies that I think are very relevant, the ILO. The ILO reports CPI data, but also food CPI data, but doesn't report prices for individual foods. Um, so you know, potentially it could, it could do that. And as, as I mentioned, Will and I are, and, uh, and others are working with the International Comparison Program at the World Bank. So anytime you use GDP data, poverty numbers, those are based on cost of living comparisons, and food is a very important part of the cost of, li of living. So they're collecting um, prices for standardized products throughout the world. The problem is they only do it every five or six years. So you know, they're hoping to increase the frequency of, um, a food, of their food price uh, collection, and, and that would be a great effort if they could do that. Wonderful. We have uh, so many hands up in the room, but let me take first the online questions. Lucy, will you go ahead with two of them? This one's from Tara from PATH USA. How do we determine affordability for nutrient-dense diets? Is there a portion, proportion of income that is considered affordable? Are there better metrics? And the second's Claudia Ringler from IFPRI. On the issue of seasonality of vegetables and fruits, do the food price indexes consider the perishability of vegetables and fruits and account for the fact that many households cannot store these? Thank you very much. Let me come back to the room. Uh, Mary, can you give the mic to Lynn right behind you? Yes. Um, this is a question that's very specific to the slide on Malawi and that's showing the cost of a caloric diet and the cost of a nutrient adequate diet in a local market versus the district, the remote local versus the district. I noticed y you had the strange finding that the remote market was actually cheaper than the district market. But actually the pattern of the coefficients was interesting because in the remote rural market, the cost of a nutritious diet, that coefficient is actually double the caloric one. Whereas in the district market, it's only 60% higher. And I wonder, is there an information content in that? Is it just a denominator issue that you have a higher denominator? Or is it that maybe there is actually more nutrient diversity in a district market that people take fruits, vegetables, et cetera, to a district market and they're not so available in a local market? So I'm just wondering if there's an information content in that. Thank you very much. I believe there had been a hand at the back on this side. Did I miss that? No, okay. Um, Lynn, why don't we pass the mic to Ruth right behind uh, Lynn, and then I will come to Julie Howard at the back, and then, yeah. Thank you, this was fascinating. Um, but I wanted to loop back to, the, you pointed out that a lot of the income data was based on wage income. And uh, the pr for the majority of rural people, agricultural production is the major source of income. And f part of the process of getting people to produce more diverse foods is to reduce, to make it profitable to produce. So in your engagement with policy, are you, how do you balance this? How much are you driving for the least possible cost for the nutritious foods, or are you trying to look for ways to make it such that agricultural producers can make a living so that they can even buy nutritious foods. Thank you. Let me take Julie Howard at the back. Great. Thanks. This is just fascinating. Thank you all for your work. I, want, I was interested in, uh, in, in Ethiopia, for example, the, the example of Ethiopia's interventions driving down particularly the cost of cereals. And I'm wondering if you have beginning uh, suggestions on, on how governments might, might intervene to drive down the cost of more nutritious foods. I know Anna uh, mentioned, mentioned one, one item, but I wondered about other suggestions that you may be thinking about for governments. The, the other question sort of follows on the, the, the policy outreach. And I'm kind of wondering, um, in my mind, it's great to see the, the breadth of governments represented here. Uh, and perhaps a question is, how deep is the engagement right now with ministries of health and with SUN? And is there an opportunity, even at this early stage, as we're still refining our methods, to begin pairing this with, with the collection of health data and health outcomes so we can, we can perhaps make, make 
faster progress on the implications are not only on the cost side, but on the, the health side. Okay. Thank you. I'm aware that the number of hands as well as online. I will take a third round. If Will, you and your colleagues are disciplined, we can manage a third round. Okay. No, you will be. Uh, thanks very much. So again, we could go in, in a, a reverse sequence. Um, I'll say just a word about policy engagement, which is, the, because very simple, we have not yet been in discussing at all with health uh, authorities regarding this. Um, it's really been squarely on the price data collection side that we've been working. The mandate of this project, I should emphasize, is research, right? Um, the, the engagement is an add-on for us um, made possible uh, primarily by Daniel's uh, and, and Anna's links uh, in, in Ghana. Um, I'll uh, say one word about Ruth's um, question and then maybe pass to others who would like to pick up any of the other questions. Um, the classic, this sort of food price dilemma between governments wanting to keep prices high for farmers and low for consumers um, is the age old food price dilemma uh, that, you know, that every, it was faced in the cereals markets and so forth. And the answer is always the same, and that's to reduce marketing margins. So the question really involves both the question of whether there are monopolies between farmers and consumers, but then whether, what is the infrastructure? What is the market facilitation, the enabling environment that allows for competitive markets to arise? How are these rural markets being managed? Is there competitive access to stalls or is access to a market stall? Is there infrastructure, lights at night, water, electricity? Those are the things that we're hypothesizing would be the key interventions at the food system level that would reduce the margin. Have, have others seen sort of parts of the energy one? Yeah, on that same question from Ruth, um, just to mention that in that conversation and collaboration we had with the Ghana Ministry of Food and Agriculture, they saw tremendous value in that expanded food list because it shone a light on foods that otherwise had been invisible. And therefore, when private sector investors in agriculture came to the ministry to use that data to understand the market and how prices were uh, varying over time and what opportunities may be. They didn't have any data on certain kinds of food, such as the dark green leafy vegetables. And so now this expanded data actually gives more information to allow that consideration of expansion into crops that had previously been invisible. Did, uh, would you like to talk about the possible intervention points? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the uh, for your question on um, whether the uh, people who are served by district capital markets are more d diversified in terms of nutrition than the remote people who are served by the remote markets. Uh, we haven't uh, investigated mm -hmm. this, um, but it's a good point. But what we do know is that. Uh, people who are served by remote markets are the food producers. So mostly the, the higher cost of diets in the DC capitals might be driven by other transportation costs or wages in the, um, in the DC capitals. So I think it's a, we're going to take uh, that point and see whether we can investigate it further. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, the policy makers in Ethiopia have admitted that uh, they have uh, given attention or focus uh, to filling people's stomachs up, up until two years uh, uh, and so ago. It's the works of uh, John Hodinot and Derek here that they have uh, now focused also on uh, nutrition, children's nutrition under PSNP, uh, Poverty Safety Net Program. Uh, recently, uh, the growth and transformation to phase of the, the, the overall uh, government policy has also given consideration on nutrition. But I think uh, uh, the uh, conclusion from this work and other works will uh, drive uh, home the, the message that po policy, agricultural policy need to focus also on the production of nutritious diets. 90% uh, of the fertilizer uh, used every year was used only on five cereals uh, for the past 15 years or so. But uh, I think this, the wor this work will uh, improve conditions on the production of nutritious diets. 
Yeah, just to, just to add on to that, I think we can actually also extrapolate uh, beyond Ethiopia and say that this is a challenge many countries face. When you go through rapid economic growth, you typically find the income elasticities, at least for animal source foods and some other foods are quite high, so demand for uh, nutrient-dense, non-stable foods goes up, but sometimes the supply response is really slow. Uh, and that's a lot, I think, to do with perishability and the, the marketing margins that Will mentioned. You have to have a lot more in place to have an efficient value chain for a highly perishable product. Um, and so some countries, you know, I mean, India also had its green revolution, but it also di uh, had quite a lot of focus on dairy in the, in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, the so-called white revolution. Um, and so it's about a trick to sort of getting a balance between, yes, solving the basic sort of calorie problem, the food security problem, uh, and also investing um, in other sectors. And then, uh, you know, within Ethiopia, I think there's, there's other specific issues going on. Um, very hard to get finance, so for the commercial sector, not just for the very small farmers, but it's very hard to get loans um, to start a business, and you know, risk is a, is, is a big issue in, for many of these products. And uh, in the poultry sector, where prices have gone up a lot, people tell me that um, foreign exchange controls are a big problem. You have to Im import these genetic breeds from overseas, but you can't get access to um, foreign exchange. And then, as, as Fantu mentioned, you know, it's not particular to Ethiopia. Many, many countries spend the vast majority of their uh, public expenditures on staple foods. I can just say something briefly in response to Julie's question about looking at the association with outcomes. I think that is absolutely the crux of what we want to be able to do here. And the challenge is a kind of a classic research challenge. I imagine that the health outcome data sets are generally implemented by entirely different agencies, and so the ability to match the data becomes really difficult. Um, I had originally hoped in Malawi they did a, a micronutrient survey recently, which includes blood samples to determine micronutrient status, and I was very excited about the potential ability to match those data on micronutrient outcomes with the cost data, and they have totally different sampling frames, and the data are collected at different times. And the value in Malawi, the, the opportunity we really have is that their household panel survey data set has a common underlying sampling frame with the consumer market price data, and they overlap entirely in time periods. And so I think the closest that we can get right now with outcomes, particularly in the Malawi case, is what we can do given the household survey data that we have, which doesn't include health outcomes. It's um, living standards measurement study data. Um, but the closest we can get, hopefully, we'll be looking at nutrient adequacy of food reported to have been consumed at the household level for now. And then ideally in the future, do better. Excellent. So maybe one very quick comment on the question of affordability and the thresholds, and then we can have time for one more round, uh, which is the main threshold we're concerned with here is 100 percent, right? We're identifying very substantial populations, in our case in Malawi, where the cost of nutritious diet <laughs> exceeds what all the resources that the household has available. So that's the beginning point of affordability, right, where clearly these are situations where safety net, you know, that's a country without any sort of robust safety net uh, at the bottom, which of course Ethiopia does have, that's why the Ethiopian wages, you know, go so much higher. Um, and, uh, and then when you're thinking about affordability uh, at anything that, you know, is actually affordable in some sense, meaning within, then it comes down to much more granular data that you would need about all the other expenditures uh, that a, house would, a household would need. When the U.S. launched its uh, poverty line, it was 30 percent, right? That was in 1960. It was a very arbitrary number. It was designed in part to get to a round number of a poverty line. Um, and clearly that would be a huge debate uh, that would be very interesting to do. It's a really great question. Thank you very much. This has been a remarkably disciplined panel. I love it. Um, let me take an online question, and then I will come uh, to the uh, several hands over here. But uh, Corinne, as we do that, begin with Suresh, and then we work backwards this way. Lucy, the online question. OK, this one's from Musaga, a student from France. In some developing countries, there can be lots of price variations within the same season due to absence of price stabilization policy. Was this taken into account in estimating prices? Thank you, Lucy. Suresh next, and then I will come to the gentleman in this row over here. Uh, Suresh Babu from IFPRI. Nice uh, presentations. In fact, it uh, gives so much of information on the prices and nutrition connection. Uh, there must be uh, um, really a monograph type of methodological kind of 
I want to suggest so that we can train more uh, staff or professionals in the National Statistical Office and so on. So I'm not sure whether you're thinking about it, but then a methodological manual, because it's all linear programming you are doing and we know that, but then the people on the other side of what we are trying to influence have no clue how you are putting your constraints and what your thresholds are, but there, there, there is a need for it. Of course, there is, starting with Peter Kalkin's work in Nepal, goes back uh, also, uh, you know, to the cost of nutrients, right? 1981 paper in AJAE uh, addressed the same thing, but then it didn't take off because there is no capacity on the ground to take the policy further. Second quick uh, taste you mentioned will uh, taste us by in passing, but that has a huge implication for the cost of uh, uh, nutrients. If, uh, the, if I can give you several examples, but we can talk about that later. But you got to Eugene Silverberg paper, General of Political Economy in 1986, I think, uh, economics of taste. Uh, you got to look at it. He does the same thing uh, in terms of cost of nutrient, but incorporates taste into it. Uh, I don't know whether you're doing it, but it will be a wonderful thing to do uh, because it has implications. Again, it's all locality specific, right? Agroecology based uh, kind of calculations have to be done because it changes, uh, cropping pattern change. Talking about Malawi, Kota Kota and Salima is entirely different from Insanja and Philombe, right? Uh, so you have to think about uh, locality specific, even less than a district, in order to do this cost of, I don't know whether it can be done, but, but it's, it's a kind of a typology that you want to have for a country and then say, in this context, the cost of nutrition is this. Uh, and then it makes more sense for the policymakers to see what kind of crops we can grow in order to address the dietary diversity, right? So finally, uh, you, we should talk about nutrition education. Uh, you talk about Moringa in Africa, right? Least cost uh, vitamin A uh, kind of, uh, I don't know whether you're monitoring price of Moringa, it's all over the place. Uh, and people are using it, uh, but it's not in the, in the, in the regular analysis. Uh, so indigenous uh, crops, and, and, and also how do we reduce, that's the point I'm trying to make. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suresh. Let me come to the gentleman here in the third row. And I see Keith. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, um, my name is Quinn Marshall. I'm a uh, nutrition PhD student at Johns Hopkins. Um, I'm interested in the capacity of uh, national statistics agencies and other government agencies who are collecting food price data to scale up, not just to more, you know, expand the food list, but also I think kind of in line with um, Derek's train of thought, like going um, to new locations and maybe in a case like Malawi, if you go even further out, you might start to see prices increase for, for certain items. So, you know, how, you know, how much uh, flexibility is there on behalf of the national um, statistics agencies? And I think it loops back as well to looking at the associations with um, diet outcomes. You know, if, if you knew that there was a household survey that was gonna take place and you had this um, challenge of the sampling frames not 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 aligning. You know, could you work with uh, national statistics agencies to, you know, for where that survey is taking place, finding the markets that that would actually um, represent the cost that they're exposed to. Thank you. I see Jess next to you. Any comment from your side? You're fine. Great. Let me come over to Keith uh, over there, and then to Julie. Thanks. Uh, Keith Wiebe from IFPRI. I wonder if you've looked at the aggregate change in demand and supply that would be involved if everyone were able to uh, consume a nutritious diet. And given the points you've made about infrastructure and marketing costs and so forth, what might be the change in prices and costs of a nutritious diet if there were a large-scale change uh, that everyone were able to consume that diet? Super. And then Julie, you have the final question. Hi, Julie from IFPRI, but also a Tufts alum, so excited about the three up there. Um, my question is about the percentage of uh, reliance on market purchases of food versus um, home production, and also how that changes with seasonality. So depending if you have, you're purchasing 80% of your food at one time in the year versus 20%, the costs um, in the market are gonna affect you differently, and so if, if that is accounted for in any way. Thank you, Will. A rich set of final round of questions, and I would like to ask you again a range, and then for you to have the final word. Excellent, yeah. So again, uh, others might have specific points that were raised that they would want to respond to. Let me just quickly pick up. Um, Julie's last question links closely to something Suresh mentioned about 
the price differences at particular locations for remote areas. All of our work is at the location of a, at the, at a marketplace. In a given month, actually uh, often the prices are weekly and then we add them up to be monthly, but it's all a price index at a marketplace for what is the food system delivering to that marketplace in that month uh, in terms of the relative cost of the different foods um, as, as discussed. There's a whole other research agenda you know, about commercialization between the market and the farm, which would be another set of research questions with much more granular geograph. It's hard enough just to get the data at the kind of market level, um, which is what we've been been focusing on. But I totally agree that this question of to what degree are households actually using these fo food prices as opposed to food prices from their own stocks that would differ um, quite quite substantially. Um, and then I love the way Keith's question sets up a lot of if pre work about price projections where one would be able to answer exactly the question that you asked with these kind of models um, that would put together uh, the demand side with supply response. Other thoughts? Yeah, I have a little well, I have a plug. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, the subsistence issue is very, very tricky. And obviously, um, in rural economies, people are going to be consuming a lot of products that they've produced on, on, on the farm. I, I would just want to advertise a paper um, that really others led, John Hodenot and uh, David Stifle and Kelly Hervona, where we looked at really rural markets. These were actually markets in the, in the PSMP program in Ethiopia, so very, very poor areas, and these are really small wet markets, often just meeting on a weekly basis. And actually a little bit different from the findings in Malawi, we've, we found that many um, nutrient-dense foods were very expensive um, in these markets. And actually, in the case of dairy, 50% of um, markets didn't even sell dairy. Um, so, you know, really sort of classic case of um, missing markets. And, and that goes with the stylized fact that about um, 85, 90% of the dairy produced in Ethiopia is consumed by the household that owns the cow, basically. Um, so, you know, these, these issues are very tricky and there's inevitably some sort of, you know, urban bias in a lot of the, the, the market um, price data we use and we really need much more investigation on, um, you know, different types of markets. I want to address Quinn's question on the um, flexibility in terms of, of modifying the monitoring systems and food lists. and. Just to say that there's a lot of flexibility when working with ministries in market information systems, um, such as the, the Ghana case with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. They have you know, a lot of latitude in how they collect the data and what they use it for and can change very quickly uh, if, if they find value in expanding the list. Um, there's a lot less flexibility when you're talking about the national statistical organizations and tracking inflation. Uh, they basically have set the list and we just hope that it's diverse enough to uh, be able to construct these metrics. And in what we found across the countries where we've done this is that it really usually is, but it's quite variable. You know, it may be from 40 items to over 200 items that are included in this um, food CPI. And that has to do with the methods of um, household budget surveys or household consumption and expenditure surveys, which are really the basis for the food list that then gets monitored. So the, I think this also gets to Suresh's point that there's a need for more nutrition sensitivity when those household budget surveys are designed so that they actually capture the foods that people eat that are nutritious and don't ignore those foods so that then they can be understood and uh, included in the metrics. And there's been some studies recently with the World Bank and the UN Statistical uh, Commission that there's huge variation across countries in how these surveys are done and how um, comprehensive they are in terms of food diversity. So there's room to work with national agencies there. Um, and then also the, the question on accounting for food preferences. Uh, we are also working with some other IFPRI researchers. Uh, Christy Mart has led an effort to look at the cost of recommended diets uh, in Myanmar and created a separate cost of recommended diet index that accounts for food preferences using that household budget survey data. So that's another future direction that um, we're looking into as well. Of course, that cost is higher than the absolute lowest cost. Uh, so we want to demonstrate the, the bare minimum, and then when you take into account food preferences, it's going to increase. Um, were there, as far as, yes? Kate has a hand. Okay. All right, I think we're out of time. So. You okay? So I, 
could just uh, really thank IFPRI for convening uh, this whole series of policy seminars, this particular project. Um, a lot of great work in-house within IFPRI, but also bridging to us at Tufts. Really appreciate the partnership um, and our collaborations with, uh, with people in the, in the field, making, you know, connecting the dots of lots of different disciplines. And I hope that you found resonance with the specific kinds of work that you do. Um, and just close with an ad for our website. The project website is uh, sites.tufts.edu Candasa. Um, pretty easy to Google uh, the acronym. Um, and really look forward to hearing from you. We'll be presenting these papers at meetings throughout the summer, uh, submitting in the fall, and then a whole new round of, of research agenda that these questions have raised. Um, I found this really inspiring work for me to be involved in, um, and I hope you found it as, as interesting as I have been to work. I Thank hope you. very much, Will. You and the entire Candasa team will visit us again at the conclusion of the project and share the results. We look forward to that. Please join me in thanking an incredible team here. Thank you very much, everyone.